you turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 23, um, there was a video released this last week and it kind of brought me to this place to where I want to share something with you and we came to a passage of scripture where it was really appropriate to do that with. People often ask, well, why do you Calvary Chapel guys teach chapter and verse through the entire Bible? Because we believe that the word of God is true and we believe that it is in fact the word that transforms people's lives. We believe that were it not for the word itself, we wouldn't understand much of anything really about how God uh, works in our lives or how we're to relate to him. Almost all of that information actually comes from the Bible. And so if we can't actually trust the Bible, or worse yet, we don't know what the Bible actually says, then we're tempted to believe that church ought to be something other than a place where you come to contact with the word. The word in this church is what we're about. We believe God's word itself has the capacity to bring truth into our lives, and that truth sets us free. And so as we get to Luke's gospel, we get to the story of the tomb. This is one of the passages that very often people will bring to you, people who believe conspiracy theories, who call themselves uh, pseudo-students of the Bible, will say, well, see, here's a place where there's a contradiction. And it's the story of the tomb. And there's a reason for that. And I want to give you a little bit of an intro here just to remind you that the Bible is comprised of 66 books. It was written over a time span of roughly 1,500 years. It was written by 40 different authors. And those authors did not get together to compare notes. In fact, one of the identifying factors in a court case, if you bring in a bunch of eyewitnesses and you ask them questions, one of the ways that you know they're telling the truth is they don't all tell you exactly the same story. They may give you certain parts of that story that are key to it, like the person was driving northbound versus southbound, or perhaps there was a right turn or a left turn, or the car was red versus black, but you're not going to get the same information out of any four people who witness anything. There will be subtle differences. Those subtle differences are based on life experience, who they are as a person, how old they are, how they view the world around them, are they emotional, are they not? So now who are the gospel authors who write what we call the synoptic gospels, that which forms the synopsis of the life of Jesus, these four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke is a Gentile. He is actually a physician. Matthew is a tax collector. He used to work for the Romans. John is basically the emo in the bunch. He's the emotional one. And Mark is a traditional Jewish man. So you have very different personalities writing from their perspective these gospel accounts. And so this morning, we're going to take our time to look at the tomb from all four perspectives the burial of Jesus in the tomb. Because there are people who say, see, well, you know, if you look at what Mark and Matthew and Luke say, and then you look at what John says, they say different things. Well, they say different things for a reason. And we're going to look at those reasons this morning as we look at Jesus' burial in the tomb. Would you join me? We'll pray. And we'll pick up in Matthew's gospel in chapter 27, verse 57 to begin. Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray now that your word would speak to us as your church, that we would glean from it, we'd learn to lean on it, that we would trust it, that this that we have in front of us is faithfully transmitted to us this day, but it was actually authored by your Holy Spirit, and it came from heaven. It isn't the manufacture of men. It's the words of God, literally written to us, that we might be instructed in all things pertaining to life and godliness. Lord Jesus, speak. We pray these things in your name. Amen. And so we have the story of the tomb in verse 57 of Matthew 27. And when evening was come, 
very important words, you should look at your Bibles as always having something to say to you. And when evening had come, to a Jewish person, evening is very important. Matthew happens to be Jewish because this happens to be the evening on the day of preparation, uh, pieces of information that were given. And so this is the last little bit of daylight before the sun goes down. And if you know anything about Judaism, Shabbat begins at sundown. It's evening. It's not quite yet night. So that means that there's still an opportunity to get a couple of things done. So when evening had come, Matthew informs us, there was a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who himself was Jesus' disciple. The word disciple means follower. It means someone who is under the tutelage of someone else. It means someone who is studying the way of someone else, who's in a discipleship uh, with that person or an apprenticeship with that person. They're a follower of someone else. But very specifically, who is Joseph a disciple of? He's a disciple very specifically of Jesus. This means that in that context, he was a believer. He actually had believed that Jesus was who Jesus said he was. Joseph, we're told, is rich. In order for someone to know that, that had to be obvious. Today, that would mean maybe they went blowing by you in you know, a Ferrari or something. During that day, it was generally understood by the clothes you wear, the people that you hung around with, where you lived. Arimathea is a town that's about 25 miles away from Jerusalem. But it was a town that was inhabited by people with some means, with some wealth. And so we're, we're given some tidbits of this storyline uh, here in Matthew's Gospel. Why do we need to know these things? Because as you read the Gospels, if you read all four Gospels and you go, hey, this one says this and that one says that and these two things don't agree, this is how conspiracy theories get started. It's like, well, if it was supposed to be written by God, they ought to both say exactly the same thing. That actually shows that you're not really a student of the Scriptures. Because the scriptures aren't supposed to be exactly the same when it refers to the gospels. What you want to be looking for is a narrative that does not contradict itself. Not whether one verse specifically says what another verse says. Those can be the differences that we have that actually mark it as being true, having come from eyewitnesses. And so we're going to walk through this story as you look at what the Bible declares about the burial of Jesus, verse 20, or excuse me, verse 58 in Matthew 27. And he, that would be Joseph of Arimathea, went to Pilate and begged, heavily requested, went to Pilate and said, I really, 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 really want the body of Jesus. And then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. This is a piece of information that's important to us because Joseph of Arimathea is a rich man and he's Jewish and this is the preparation day for Passover. The moment Joseph of Arimathea touches that body of Jesus, he is ceremonially unclean. So that means that he really, really wants the body of Jesus. He's willing to become ceremonially unclean to touch the dead body of Jesus. That's how much Jesus means to him. In other words, Jesus means more to Joseph of Arimathea than Judaism does. He couldn't enter the synagogue. He couldn't ce ce celebrate with everyone else. John's Gospel gives us a little insight in chapter 18 of John's Gospel, verse 28. And then they led Jesus from Caiaphas under the hall of the judgment. And it was early, and they themselves, and there they're speaking of the guys who actually arrested Jesus. So the rulers, the scribes, the Pharisees, Annas and Caiaphas, they, here's the difference between Matthew's account and John telling us what the Pharisees did in exactly the same situation you see, the Pharisees would not go into the judgment hall lest they be defiled that they might eat the Passover. So here is this man, Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man, 
who is also a ruler in the synagogue, who cares very much about his roots, I'm sure, but he knows the difference between Jesus and the law. He completely gets it. He knows what it's going to cost him. And verse 59 of Matthew 27, back to that narrative. And notice up to this point, there's no mention of the other guy that very often everyone gets hung up on. And that is Nicodemus. So far, all we've met is Joseph. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped the body in a clean linen cloth. Now here's the crazy part. This is where it differs from John's account. Because there are two different Greek words that are translated here from probably the original Aramaic words, which is a type of Paleo-Hebrew. And so here he says, wrapped it. He uses a term that would be for something like we would call maybe a blanket, a sheet, could be a tunic, it's a single piece. Hmm. That sounds different, and it is, and it's different for a reason. He uses the Greek word sendon here for the cloth. Notice what he does. He hastily wraps the body of Jesus, verse 60, and Joseph laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And they, the word used he, but it implies they, rolled a great stone upon or over the door opening of the sepulcher and departed. So here's where it gets crazy. People say, see, there's the burial of Jesus. If that's true, then John's gospel records something that's false. Because John's gospel actually records that Jesus wasn't just in a single cloth, he was in fact in grave clothes. And furthermore, it actually had a separate headpiece. Which one's true? Or maybe, could it be that these two authors are recording two different events that just happened to happen at the same tomb in a matter of a couple of hours. That's why it pays to know your Bible. So Joseph of Arimathea has gone to Pilate, asked for the body of Jesus, received the body of Jesus. He's now actually wrapped Jesus in a cloth, buried Jesus, rolled the stone over the door, and guess what? He left. The stone's already in front of the doorway. What's going on here? Your mind begins to go, well, you know, I think uh, somewhere else it says something else. Notice verse 61. And there was Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, sitting over against the sepulcher. So the conspiracy theorists are all starting to go, well, I think one of the other gospels says something completely different, like they came and they came with spices and blah, 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 blah. What's going on here? I'll tell you what's going on. The two ladies know exactly where Jesus is buried. And that's a very important piece of information, but it's not the final piece of information. And these two stories are not exactly the same. They're not even talking about the same event. They're talking about something completely different. So after Matthew's gospel account, which is there in chapter 27, next we would go to Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 15, if you want to turn there to verse 42. And notice it's very similar. And now when evening was come, because it was the preparation, so there's another piece of information. Preparation for what? Preparation for Passover. In other words, it's evening, it's late afternoon, it's approaching sunset. And because it was the preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath. So it's the day before the Sabbath. This informs us that Jesus died on the day of preparation. 
all of them were called Passover. The whole week, in fact, is called Passover. So people are like, well, he wasn't actually, he didn't die on Passover. Well, that depends on who you listen to. If you listen to people who don't know what the Bible says, then that would be true. But if you actually look at it from this perspective, the Jewish perspective, the whole week was Passover week. So he definitely died on Passover. Very specifically, the day before, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So that makes this Thursday late afternoon. There'll be Passover, the traditional, which will be Friday into Saturday, and a special one, which is Passover itself, which is actually Friday. So you have this whole thing spanning three days. Mark 15, verse 43, and Joseph of Arimathea was an honorable counselor. Here's another little piece of information. Seems to be different, but it's actually informing us of something else. Any of you know how our legal system works? One of the titles used for attorneys in a court of law is counselor, amen? means exactly the same thing during this day and time, except that the counselors were the members of the Sanhedrin. They were, in essence, the legal uh, counsel of that day. So when we say, well, Mr. Counsel, counselor, uh, what, what do you have to say in defense of your, of your client? And this is the same thing. He was an honorable counselor. In other words, he was a member of the Sanhedrin himself. But which he also waited for the kingdom of God. He had believed on Jesus. He was a believing member of the Sanhedrin. And he came and went boldly into Pilate and, and craved for the body of Jesus. And so you can see these things are similar, but they're not exactly informing you of the same exact pieces of information. They're giving you little tiny tidbits. This is why it's so important that you don't make up doctrine based on a single verse that you take out of context. I've had people come to me and say, well, you know, you're actually not saved by just faith that results in grace alone. You actually have to do works. Well, that comes from an improper understanding of what the Bible actually says about how you're saved in the first place. For by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourself, it's a gift of God. It is not of works, lest anyone should boast. You stop at the not of works part. And then you interject passages like 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where it says, here's this long list of th sins, things that you shouldn't be. And if you are one of those things, they make the jump. Well, you know, if you're still doing those things, then you couldn't possibly be saved. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible actually teaches very clearly, Paul himself writes about it, that in fact, Paul himself struggled with sin in his life as a believer. That doesn't tell us how he struggled. It doesn't tell us when he struggled. It just simply says, those things which I will to do, those things I do not do, there in Romans 7, those things which I do not will to do, those very things I do do, well, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he says, I thank God that Christ Jesus, my Savior, will do that. He wasn't just talking about his past experience. We all would have past experience. He's speaking to Christians who are Romans. He's saying, look, we, we all have this nature that is still within us. It is under the control of the Holy Spirit. It should be driven. You need to read the entire Bible. That's why we study the Bible cover to cover in this church. That's why we encourage you to read the whole Bible. These things are important to us to inform our minds of the truth of God's word. Otherwise, we get caught up in believing things that are not true. He asked for the body of Jesus. Then verse 44, it says in Mark's gospel, in Mark 15, then Pilate marveled. Why would he marvel? Well, because he's a noble counselor. He's a member of the Sanhedrin. And the guys that brought Jesus in in the first place refused to go into his courtyard, and here comes a guy who's out of the same group, and he comes in. Why? Because he was a follower of Jesus. He loved Jesus more than he loved the law. He had it right. And even though he wasn't one of the 12 apostles, he was absolutely a disciple. Here's another thing that comes into view for people. Well, the disciples and the apostles, they're the same group. No, that's actually not true. There may have been by this time 
thousands. We don't know for sure how many disciples there were, but there were just 12 apostles who happened to also be disciples. You see how knowing what your Bible actually says prevents you from believing things that aren't true. You see, there's no confusion in the mind of God. There's confusion often in the mind of men. And so the Bible is actually trying to help us understand this whole situation. Verse 45, same, Mark 15. And when Pilate knew it, that Jesus was dead, because they'd all forsaken him, he gave the body to Joseph. And he, that would be Joseph, again, wrapped him in fine linen, took him down, and laid him in a sepulcher. And then he rolled the door over the Rolled the stone over the door of the tomb. So again, we're told Jesus, Jesus is dead, Jesus is buried. And he's only wrapped. Notice verse 47. Again, Mary Magdalene, the mother of Jesus, beheld where he was laid. So you've got these ladies. Did they have anything to do with what was going on with the life of Jesus? Because if they did, then the gospels seem to disagree one with another unless there's more than one burial of Jesus. Luke, our passage that we would be in today, and behold, there was a man named Joseph, so it goes the same direction. But Luke gives us some additional information. He was a counselor. He was a good man. He was a just Man, verse 51, and he had not consented, not agreed, not entered into counsel with them. In other words, he was a dissenting voice amongst the Sanhedrin. He was actually there when they were debating what should be done with Jesus, and he said, Jesus is innocent. Just like the thief on the cross, Joseph of Arimathea believed that Jesus was who he said he was, and that Jesus was innocent. Why? Because he was actually of the Jews, but he himself waited for the kingdom of God. He was looking forward to the kingdom. So again, they're just little subtle things. This man went into Pilate, verse 52, and begged, and he took him down and wrapped him. So Luke gives the same description, and he says the same thing. The sendin comes out, this, this wrapping, this thing that would be like a shroud or a blanket or just simply a sheet. Basically, Jesus is inside of a sheet in this story. This is a problem for our most common understanding when we get to Easter. Because one of the most descriptive things about Easter is what John and Peter see when they get inside the tomb, Right? You're sitting there going, oh, man, well, you know, I think the Bible says that Jesus was all wrapped up and he had spices and everything else. Isn't that part of the Easter? It is. Verse 55 of Luke 23, and the women also which came with him, that would be Jesus, from Galilee, followed after and beheld the sepulcher and how or the manner in which his body was laid. In other words, they actually knew that he had been improperly buried. This was not according to custom. This wasn't how it was supposed to be done. This was not the traditional way that a Jewish body would be prepared for a grave. And so the women are actually identified in Mark's gospel. It's Mary Magdalene. It's Mary, the mother of James. And it's Salome. As well as another piece of information this is why it's so important to read the entire Bible. A whole bunch of other ladies. There's actually a contingent of women, if you want to look at it. Many other women which came up with him to Jerusalem. And now notice this. Where's Jesus according to what we've read? He's already in the grave He's wrapped in a sheet, and the stone is over the door. So what gives? And they, the women, prepared spices and ointments. It's like, oh no, man, this is like a, this is a nightmare. 
Jesus is already in the tomb. What are they doing that for? So here's what your conspiracy theorist spoke to. See, the Bible is contradictory. It doesn't say the same thing. It doesn't mean what it says. It doesn't say what it means. In John's account, we find some interesting and added truths that do not contradict, but actually enlarge this whole story. So now turn to John's gospel to chapter 19. Specifically to verse 38. And then after this, Jesus, still on the cross, they pierce his side, they don't break his legs. Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for the fear of the Jews, there's another interesting piece of information. Joseph of Arimathea was not out and about during that time about his relationship with Jesus. Why? Because God's got a very specific job for him to do. Because here's what the Romans would have done, and here's what the Jews would have done, specifically the religious leaders of the Jews who actually disagreed with Joseph of Arimathea. You see, they would have taken Jesus' body as a criminal and thrown it in the trash heap of the Hinnom Valley. That's what they would have done. But in their midst is one single member of the Sanhedrin named Joseph of Arimathea who is going to care for the body of Jesus. And he is hastily going to make sure that Jesus' body is saved from what the Jewish religious leadership would have done to it. And because he doesn't care that he's going to be ceremonially unclean for Passover, he goes straight into Pilate's court and says, can I please have the body of Jesus? And because Pilate still believes that Jesus died an innocent man, he says yes. He besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave, and he came and took the body of Jesus. A secret follower preserved for this very moment this one little tiny tidbit of information that isn't a contradiction. It's the reason that John's gospel gets to record actually the final dispensation of the remains of Jesus. In other words, it's telling a bit of the story before the end. You see, if he'd been known as a follower of Jesus... They would have done everything they could to beat him to the punch. They would have gone and probably ripped Jesus' body down from the cross and just simply disposed of it as trash. And here are these women who know exactly where the grave is. And yet, Joseph of Arimathea did it by stealth. And here comes the first mention of the other guy. The one that causes people so much grief sometimes. And there came also Nicodemus, verse 39 of John 19. Which at the first came to Jesus by night. You see, Joseph of Arimathea comes by night after, and Nicodemus comes by night before he gets saved. These are two guys with kind of a similar story, but for completely different reasons. Nicodemus is like, I, I want to know who this Jesus guy is, but I'm not sure I want anybody to know about it. And Joseph says, I know who this guy is, and God's preserving me for his very special task. And he brought a mixture of myrrh and aloe, about 100 pounds. Now, here's where it gets crazy. Where's Jesus? If all you read is Matthew... Mark and Luke, Jesus is already buried, amen? He got buried by Joseph of Arimathea. He's already in a grave, and the stone's already in front of the grave. But notice the subtle differences. There's about 100 pounds in weight. Now, we think in a modern sense, right? So there's probably many of you guys here can relate back before Home Depot started selling concrete in bags that were like 50, 60, 25 pounds, Every sack of cement that came as raw cement was exactly 94 pounds. 
So you could get a 94-pound sack of cement. Most of us could probably pick that up, put it on our shoulders, and go someplace with it. But this is 100 pounds of spices, plural. They're not all mixed in the same jar. And in fact, nobody had something big enough to carry that many pounds of aloe in a single jar or a single vase. There would have been multiple jars and multiple vases. So there's a bunch of people involved here. And we're told how many pounds and that it's a couple of spices. So this is going to take some people joining in. We already know that Joseph acquired the body. We already know that the body's already been wrapped in a single piece of cloth and it's in the tomb. They know exactly where to find the body of Jesus. But they're not coming to do what Joseph of Arimathea has done already. They're coming to do something completely different. Verse 40. So here comes Nicodemus. Look at verse 40. And they, plural, not one guy, not just a servant, but the ladies that have already been mentioned and all the people necessary to carry the spices, they took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen cloths with the spices as is the manner of the Jews to bury it. So here is the moral of this story. Joseph of Arimathea is used to actually preserve the body of Jesus for burial. It's already buried. The ladies witnessed him do it. They saw where the body is, and now they've come back to do exactly what should have been done the first time, but couldn't have because of the fear of the Jewish people, what they would do if they got a hold of the body of Jesus. In other words, you might be saying, what difference does it make? Well, it makes a lot of difference if you're a student of the Bible. Because if you can find a contradiction, if you can find an untruth, if you find something that's in there and it's been passed along for centuries, millennia, and it's not true, then we could question the Bible. It's veracity, it's truth. How did we get it? Where did it come from? But the more you dig into the Scriptures, the more you inspect them, the more you do what has been done over millennia, which is to take the scriptures and try and find these very things and point to some form of contradiction and say, see, the Bible's not trustworthy. Well, the Bible is very trustworthy. Jesus was buried exactly two times in the same tomb. First by Joseph of Arimathea to preserve his body so that it could be buried fully and completely the second time by bringing a group of people called the they there that included all the Marys carrying jars of spices and the linen wrappings. And here's how we know that. Because the word now, instead of senden that's being, being used, is othonion, which is a medical bandage. Very thin strips. And so when John's gospel records for us that on the day of the resurrection... He was wrapped in bandages. If you just read what three of the gospel authors wrote, you would go, there's your contradiction. Because the resurrection accounts all say that he was raised through those bandages. And in fact, there was a single piece of a linen head wrapping, which is not mentioned at all in Matthew and Mark and Luke, but is mentioned after the resurrection as the resurrection account is recorded by the gospel authors. Why? Because after the fact, they only saw the results of what happens and is recorded in John's gospel. Because Jesus was placed in, the stone was then rolled away, Jesus' body was prepared for burial, and the stone was rolled back. And so come Easter morning, come resurrection morning, Jesus passed through those things called the othonium, the bandages, and the head napkin was put in a place by itself. It wasn't just the single shroud that covered him in the first place. It was only Luke's gospel that records that final little bit of information to complete the picture so that when you read of the resurrection, you can see that God was accurate. God was perfectly accurate. Nicodemus simply opened the tomb. 
He had a group of servants with him that were carrying all those jars. The ladies were there. They knew where he was buried. They could identify exactly which tomb it was. So I pray that as you look at your Bible, you'll trust it because the sepulcher was prepared. That's exactly what happened. Joseph of Arimathea hewn out a rock tomb that had never had anybody laid in it, and he put Jesus in it. And then he went away. And as the ladies watched, they went back to Nicodemus. And Nicodemus came back and finished, in essence, the process. The Passover lamb absolutely was dead. And by now, it is also Passover. This whole process as it takes place actually extends this whole thing into Passover. The final day, not just the day of preparation. And as they watched and did all these things, as they worked, these two Sabbaths that have these related events, as we see Jesus placed in that tomb, not once but twice, at a high Sabbath, they had a regular weekly Sabbath. So you have these things that if you don't actually read your Bible well, if you just kind of pass over it, if you just glance over a handful of verses, you might come to the conclusion that maybe there's a mistake. Your Bible is trustworthy. It's accurate. Because what the Bible goes on to say is these same people waited for the Lord. They watched all these things. They saw Jesus dead. They saw Jesus buried. They saw Jesus' body prepared. But they also remembered what the Old Testament said about Messiah. That the grave wouldn't be able to hold him. They were actually doing all these things so that when Jesus was raised, there could be no doubt about what happened. If you combine these events, there are at a minimum a dozen people involved in the burial of Jesus who all handled his dead body, who put him in the tomb the first place, took and wrapped him the second time, covered his body with aloe and spices, wrapped his body in medical bandages, wrapped his head. So now you can imagine... When Jesus is raised and Peter and John look in, you see, they would have been expecting to see the results of a Jewish burial. And if his body had been stolen, those bandages either would have been cut off or unwrapped. But they were laying right where he laid. And he didn't have to just slip out of a sheet. He was wrapped tightly. But he's not there. He is risen. Amen? You can trust your Bible. It's accurate. It doesn't contain contradictions. But it does require your study. So I pray as we journey through the Bible, you'll understand why. That the Bible is the best commentary on itself. Very often people ask, well, what commentary do you use? Most of the time, the Bible itself. The Bible often speaks of itself. And when it does, it's 100% accurate. Yeah, commentators, myself included, sometimes we may miss it a little bit, but God doesn't miss it. He's always right, and what he says is always true. Amen? Amen. Would you stand and we'll close in prayer? Amen. Moral of the story, that's why we study the whole Bible, cover to cover. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being able to study the word, that, Father, we have the joy of being able to recall and bring to mind the glorious things that you did, that you testified of, uh, that we now can look at, especially where the Old Testament and New Testament cross each other's paths knowing that we have so much manuscript evidence to look back on our Bibles and 
see they've been faithfully transmitted from generation to generation. Uh, and it still says what it's always said. And so, Lord, we give you our lives afresh. Thank you for the truth of your word. And pray that you would bless us, Lord, as we endeavor uh, to study it, to learn more about you, and to learn to walk with you. Uh, Lord, we give you our lives fresh and anew. We indeed do believe that you were buried, you were literally dead, but you are in fact alive and raised today, and your word testifies of it. In Jesus' name, amen.